case, uh, but welcome all of you and uh, welcome to the folks that are going to watch this on video. Um, my name is Dan Gilbarg. I'm a professor of sociology at BCC. I've been here for a long time. Um, and I'm the chair of a multicultural committee that puts on programs that deal with different issues of inequality in our society. And one of the most critical issues in our society is gender inequality, inequality between men and women. Um, when I started teaching at Bristol Community College in 1969, um, women who worked full time made 64 cents on the dollar compared to what men made. Now there's been great progress, but it's still only 77 cents. So think about it. You're talking about people working full time making 77 cents compared to what somebody else is making working the same amount of time. Um, and so there's been, a, there's been real progress, but there's a long ways to go. This is a serious issue. And uh, it's not a question of unequal education, because at this point, women are getting college education just as men are. Um, it, there are other factors that, ex that help to explain it. So that's what this event is about. Um, it's taking place in March, which is Women's History Month. And also the 8th, which is in three days, is International Women's Day. Um, so these are things that are set up to recognize that these are issues that we need to be really taking seriously. Uh, what we have today in terms of a program is three professional women from this area to talk a little bit about their experiences and help give us perspective on a personal level of, what, of how these issues have played out. Um, and uh, each one is going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes. And, um, then at the end of that, I'll introduce each person one by one. And then at the end of that, I'll be speaking a little bit more about the reasons for inequality in our society, gender inequality, and what can be done. And then we'll, there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions on your part. So first, let me introduce uh, Lynn Whitney. Lynn is an attorney in the greater New Bedford area. Uh, she's been working as an attorney for 32 years. Uh, she's been president of the New Bedford Bar Association and the Bristol County Bar Association and the Massachusetts Women's Bar Association. And uh, she'll talk a little bit about her experiences uh, in the professional world of lawyers. Lynn? Just to correct one thing, I wasn't president of the Women's Bar Association. I've just been involved over the years, primarily in the Legislative Policy Committee. But in any event, I <laughs> don't want to say too much. Um, yes, um, when I came to New Bedford in 1980, uh, I came initially as a uh, legal services lawyer. Uh, I was one of very few lawyers, uh, women lawyers, uh, in New Bedford at the time. There were over 100 lawyers, but there were uh, fewer than seven of us who actually did trial work. Um, and, you know, we met on a regular basis um, and sort of supported each other um, with the kinds of day-to-day uh, sexism uh, that we would uh, encounter. And in, in those days, it was, it was very much more blatant uh, than it is uh, these days. It's um, certainly gotten more subtle over the years, and I think that that has to do with uh, some consciousness raising that's gone on. Uh, I was 28 years old at the time, and uh, I'll cite a few examples of, the, of what I ran into initially. Um, I was doing housing law and uh, representing tenants uh, in uh, landlord-tenant cases. On one of my first trips to court uh, to get an emergency restraining order to keep a landlord from illegally evicting a tenant without uh, going through the court process, uh, the matter was heard in the judge judge's chambers, which is basically the judge's office. Um, after the judge looked over my paperwork uh, and asked me a little bit uh, about myself and uh, uh, told me that he was going to uh, allow my motion and that I was such a pretty thing that I could come back any time. And then he blew me a kiss. Um, I was shocked uh, at that, of course, and it was very disconcerting because I wanted to be taken seriously as a lawyer. Uh, I did not want to be treated frivolously, and my paperwork was in order, and I wanted that to be respected. But that's not the way he saw it, necessarily. He, he saw me as a, a young female. Another time, I had won a housing trial, and uh, the landlord has to pay uh, for the attorney's fees um, if they violated uh, a particular law. And uh, I was arguing uh, in front of a judge uh, that um, I should be paid certain attorney's fees. I had filed an affidavit, and my hourly rate uh, at the time was $100 per hour. And my male 
uh, colleague was uh, arguing against my fee award, and the judge stopped him and said, don't you think she's worth $100 an hour, sort of as a wink-wink. And uh, I got my award, but I felt like I lost my dignity uh, in the exchange. And it was that sort of thing that went on all the time. I went into private practice in 1982, and I was doing criminal defense work. And when you, uh, you would uh, have to um, go into plea bargain conferences uh, with the assistant district attorney. And this was generally held in a small conference room. Uh, in the district court. And there were usually several other uh, lawyers in there, mostly men. Uh, and what would happen is that they would all be talking sports in excruciating detail. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm always for the home team, but I, I don't know people's statistics or um, histories or, or that sort of thing. And there was a lot of sort of male bonding that would be going on about, you know, their respective teams or players that they that they particularly liked, and I always felt that I was I was left out, and um, you know I ended up having to be a little bit more pushy or you know make fun, you know, to to sort of uh, get the the conversation away from uh, the sports. But I also think that um, you know the district assistant district attorneys who are human beings um, you know oftentimes would be more amenable to better deals with the people who uh, had uh, the same interests uh, in the sports or or other uh, types of things on another occasion um, I was arguing a uh, particular matter uh, in front of a judge and I had an, an older male colleague who was arguing against me and he was arguing in a very condescending fashion uh, toward me, and he ended up uh, referring to me as dear uh, in front of the judge. And uh, so I uh, came back and argued my point and called him honey. I was scolded by the judge for being disrespectful. You know, these are the kinds of things that would go on uh, pretty regularly. Uh, so that in 1989, uh, the court system actually did do a gender bias study. Um, and they interviewed, uh, they interviewed people in the whole court system, but they also interviewed uh, female attorneys. And um, they found that um, this gender bias uh, undermined uh, the credibility of female attorneys, hampering their role as advocates and adversely affecting outcomes. And don't kid yourself, it, it's not over. It's, it's better than it was. There's no question about that. Um, but we have a long way to go. Women professionals are simply not taken as seriously as male professionals. And I, I think you can say that pretty much across the board. Uh, as a woman attorney, I have found that I've had to be more prepared, more aggressive, more willing to take risks than my male colleagues basically to get to the same place. I have a spoon rest in my kitchen that speaks to this, actually. And uh, it's a joke, but it says, <laughs> whatever a woman does, she must do it twice as well as a man to be thought of as half as good. This is a little asterisk that says, fortunately, this is not difficult. <laughs> so I'll take it. Do you want to do questions now? Or? We'll come back and uh, talk with Lynn later uh, as far as any questions that people might have. Um, I'd now like to introduce Mary Sahadi. Mary is an accountant in the Fall River area, correct? Yes. And she's been an accountant for 32 years, and she was the first CPA in Fall River. Okay. Let me introduce Mary Sahadi. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So we are here today to speak about the equality of women in business, and we're here to talk about the inequalities as well. Um, if I roll you back to 1975, when I was graduating from Bishop Stang High School, my dad was still alive, and I really wanted to be an engineer. And I wanted to be an engineer in the worst way. Math was always my favorite subject. Um, but as my dad would say to me, darling, that's not going to work for you. We did a lot of research together. We did a lot of job searching together. And what we found was exactly what he knew right away, which was there were no or very few women engineers at that time. 
So being my dad's favorite little girl, he and I did some research and we decided that maybe accounting was the direction that I should go into. So I did my four years at UMass Dartmouth, which was then SMU, and I came out of school looking for a job. And just as we knew back then, men got the better jobs. Men got the better pay, men got the better jobs. And so I did my search and I wanted to stay local. So I wanted to stay in a local CPA firm in the city. And I wanted to be equal with my counterpart men friends, if you will, they were graduating from school at the same time. But yet, as was the case back in 1978, which was when I was graduating from UMass Dartmouth, men were getting paid more. The going salaries at that time were $10,400 for a man coming out of SMU with a bachelor's degree in accounting, and it was $7,800 for a woman. And I was damned if I was going to take $7,800. So being as persistent as I am today, I was back in 1978, and I fought for my rights. And I actually got my first job working for Bruce Haig. And at the time, it was Haig and Federico. And I got $10,400. So I was very proud of myself. And my dad was very proud of me as well. However, that was still the uphill battle. Because it was definitely a man's world. And it still is a man's world. Um, I then proceeded to get my master's in tax, again at Bentley, a man's world. Most of the students in the class were all men. Um, I wanted to be a partner in the firm. It was only men that were partners in the firm. The women in the firm at that time were very few, and the few women, including myself, were generally thought of, although we had degrees in accounting, were thought of as secretaries. We were asked to make the copies. We were asked to staple the documents. Um, we were never asked to go to the client meetings. But that wasn't going to be the case for myself. I was going to be persistent, and I was going to get what I wanted. So I pursued my master's in tax. I obtained that degree, and then I wanted to be a CPA. Um, as you just heard, I was the first CPA in forever. Um, it was a man's world. It's still a man's world. Although I will tell you, now being a partner with the firm since 1987, um, we have more female accountants slash auditors that work for the office now than we ever have um, in the past. So there is some equality, and we still have a long, long way to go. But from history and from my experiences, it's always been a man's world. You go to a client, they ask for Bruce Haig. They don't ask for Mary Sahadi. Now they do, but back 20 years ago, they would never have thought to do that. Um, all I can tell you is you have to fight for your rights. You have to, you are, you are as equal, the women in this room are as equal as the men in this room, and they deserve to be paid the same salaries. They deserve to get the same benefits. Um, I can roll that forward to today. I have two very good friends that are both detectives at the state police. It's husband and wife. And it's very, very interesting that their children today, to this day, believe that daddy goes out and gets the bad guys, but mommy works in the office. And yet both of them are detectives for the state police. They've both passed the exams. They've both done their time in terms of the research and the, and the necessary experience hours to become detectives. But yet their children think daddy is the person who gets the bad guys and mommy is the person who works in the office. Um, so, so what I want to tell you here today is, yes, we've come a long, long way since 1978 when there were really no men in the field of accounting, but, or no men in a lot of the fields, but we have a long way to go. And for the women in this room, keep fighting because you have a right and you are equal and you're just as smart as the guy sitting next to you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'd like, now I'd like to introduce Joan Menard. Uh, Joan is now a dean at this college, uh, but prior to that, she served in the Massachusetts State Legislature for years and years. Um, just to give you an idea, she was, for the last 11 years, she was a senator, state senator from the Fall River, greater Fall River area. Um, for the 21 years prior to that, she was a state representative from the district that represented Somerset, Swansea, and the area over there. Um, and uh, one of her firsts, if you want to say, was that sh she was an appointed a leader, part of the leadership team in the House in 1984. 
She was the first woman to hold a leadership position in the 223-year history of the House of Representatives. Um, so that was quite an achievement. And she also served as the Democratic Party chair for a number of years and was also for 12 years the chair of the state Democratic Party chairs. So she was in, had a national position during all that time. So she's achieved a lot politically. Um, and uh, so she's here to tell her story and a little bit of perspective on the fight for women's equality in, in the world of politics. Joan Lenard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I gave you my resume because um, I, I, I came here, I'm standing here, I got here in a very different way than a lot of other people uh, that were, I guess, more fortunate than I. Um, I graduated from high school and it wasn't unusual uh, in 1953 and got married and went to work as a bookkeeper. Um, in a local little local business uh, my and my husband was working at a plant down in on, on the waterfront called firestone which most of you don't remember but he was there for about a year and a half and uh they closed and so the two of us were like what do we do now with our lives uh, so we decided he was going to go to school and so i stayed working he went to college, and as he, a couple of years went by, I hope you don't mind me telling my life story, because uh, a couple of years went by, and I realized, you know something, I was probably the smartest kid in my, in my class, I thought I was anyway, didn't always do my homework, but I was the smartest kid in the class, and I had, I had won a, a scholarship, a full scholarship to Stonehill College, but we had no money whatsoever, we didn't even know where to begin, and we had no guidance. So I just gave up the scholarship and proceeded with my life. So I decided I was going to start school. So I worked during the day. My husband was in college full time. And um, I started taking classes at Bridgewater at night. Uh, eight years later, I graduated and with an, a degree in teaching. And my husband, in the meantime, had graduated, and we, um, he started teaching at Diamond. We then um, both decided that we would continue, so we stayed part-time, working full-time, and um, got our master's degrees. And I went to teach, I started teaching here in, Summer, in uh, Fall River in a small private school, and then I went to teach in Somerset, fourth grade, at the Chase Street School, Somerset one of my favorite jobs ever. And um, I liked the job and everything. And one day somebody said to me, gee, you really do a good job. By the way, the first class I had, 44 kids. No AIDS, 44 kids. And they said, you really do a good job and you work hard. And I was going for my master's and everything. Uh, would you like to try special education? And I, what's that? I, I said, I think I have most of the difficult kids in my class right now. And they said, yes, but this is even better because now there's a new law and they're going to allow you to take those kids who have all these issues and put them in a class and have individual plans for them and work with them privately. I said, okay, sounds good. From 44 to seven or eight, sounded good to me. Um, and I think part of uh, my success, or whatever you call it, my life, has been that I was willing to take those chances and willing to work hard, but willing to take those chances. I then took the chance and went to this, took this little special ed class, and then a year later they said, well, you know, we need to have a, a director of special education for the town of Somerset, and you're the only one with special ed, ex real special ed experience. I had gotten certified and everything. Um, and I said, I'll apply. Now, when I applied, it was me and five male principals. So I thought, I'm never getting this job. Because they looked at it as it's a system-wide job, and it was a promotion for them. And I said, I'm never getting this job. So the school committee met and everything, and they called me at 11 o'clock that night. I think there might have been some discussion. And they said, you've got the job. So I became the director of special education. 
Now, this is all in the space of maybe 12 or 13 hard work years, really hard work. So I was the first woman that was really ever an administrator in the town of Somerset. There were women during the Second World War that took people's places as principals, but they were all men. They were all men. The superintendent, of course, was a man. All of the principals were men. Everybody in the administrative, administration building were men. Um, but they were terrific to me. They helped me. There was a little resistance when I went from school to school and told them what they had to do. Um, but it was okay. And, and I guess I'm, I'm telling you all this because it was really hard work um, and, and good luck that brought me to that point. While I was there, someone uh, in the special ed department at the, at the uh, Department of Education said we need to do some new regulations and they called me and said, would you be willing to serve on this committee? And I said, sure. And, uh, and at the meantime, in the meantime, I said, I, I'm going to start my doctorate. So I started, again, working all day, commuting up to Boston, starting work on my doctorate. And um, by being on this committee, I started listening to people who felt they could really make a difference. I felt I was really making a difference. I was a little... Um, I was making policy, I was seeing a lot of people, I was a boss, I was the first woman in that administration building that was really able to sit at the table with all the boys. Um, but I started getting interested in sort of making other kinds of decisions and I, someone said to me one day, um, would you like to work on uh, some of the bylaws for the town? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And I didn't know anything about the bylaws for the town, but I said, I'll, I'll learn and I'll try. So I, I did that. Anyway, I decided I would run for state representative. Now, this was a crazy, crazy decision. Um, I had a great job. It was 15 minutes from my house. Um, I had lifelong tenure. Um, I made more money than a state rep. And I just decided that I really wanted to do th that job. And I really thought I could do it. And so all the girls got together and helped me. Every night at 4 o'clock after I got out of work, about 4.30, there was a car in my driveway, and we went door to door to every single door in the town of Somerset. And I won the election by 120 votes. So, fast forward to the reality of going to the State House. The reality of going to the State House is everybody thinks you're a secretary. That's the first thing. They look at you and it was like, um, I walked into the, the Speaker's office, the Speaker said to me, uh, the Speaker was great. It was Speaker McGee at the time. He was great. He said, I have an office for you. You want to be in the Education Committee? I said, yeah, I'd love to be in there. Okay, I have an office for you. So I go up with all my stuff. Now, remember, I had been in the administration building. I had two secretaries. I really thought I was, you know, pretty spiffy. I go up with all my stuff, and the chairman of the committee says, who are you? I said, well, I'm a new representative. I don't have room here for you. So I'm looking at him, and I really don't want Now, I don't think he would have treated a guy like that. Anyway, I go back to the, to the speaker and say, they don't want me up there. There's no room. Picked up the phone. He said some really bad words uh, read to the guy. And now I have to go back. So the guy is over there. So he put me in the corner where all of the other people had really nice space. I had this little space in the corner uh, with a telephone, and my aide was sharing my desk. So that was my beginning, at, the, at my political beginning. Uh, it did go uphill from there. 
Um, I really worked hard. I was appointed to be the first woman majority whip in the House. There had never been a woman in leadership in 200 years in the Massachusetts House. Now, that's hard to believe. Um, I took that as an enormous compliment, but not just for me, but as an enormous step forward for women. Um, I stayed in the, in the State House, if you know anything about politics, uh, when you, the speaker leaves and you're with the wrong person, you go to the basement and then you come back maybe with the next person. I had a lot of ups and downs. But around 10 years, or maybe eight years after I was there for, for some time, and I was the, the majority whip for another speaker, Charlie Flaherty, uh, he came to me and said, um, I'd like you to run for the state party chair the Democratic Party chair. And I said, oh, why? Um, all those crazy Democrats, you know, from the left to the right, and a few in the middle, but a lot of extremes. It's a hard job, a really hard job. He said, no, we need somebody from the legislature there so they can bridge the gap. And um, so anyway, I ran. It was one of the hardest campaigns I've ever had. It went through, I think, seven or eight ballots. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I, I, it's okay to tell. I don't want to use up all the time. But I have a little story about, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Ray Flynn. He was a tough, tough mayor of Boston. He and I didn't agree on one single thing, period. But he had total control over the city and uh, the political structure in the city. And um, a friend of mine brought me over to meet him at the Parkman House in Boston, which is his little getaway from City Hall. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Mayor, would you be willing to get your, your delegation, and he had the largest delegation, of course, that was voting, to vote for me? He said, no. And I said, OK. Um, he said, first of all, you and I don't agree on one single thing ever. He was the one that led the anti-desegregation in Boston, a very, very conservative, very you know, conservative guy. He and I were on opposite side of every issue. Um, he said, but I want, a, I want a Boston guy. And I said, OK. Um, how about if the Boston guy gets eliminated? And he thought for a minute. He said, you have a lot of guts to come over here to talk to me. He said, yes, I'll give you my, my delegation if he leaves. And the reason I, I'm pointing that out is that um, one of the ways in life that you have to deal with people is to let them know who you are, but be agreeable and not, and not avoid them. I mean, the, it is what it is. He believed what he believed. He ended up making me, the, really, the Demo chair of the Democratic Party. The guy got eliminated. He tossed all his votes to me. I won the race. So I then became the chairman of the Democratic Party, um, which for seven years was a great fun. And as you can imagine, I was the first woman that was the Democratic chair in Massachusetts. I then decided, or somebody decided for me, I was going to run to be the president of all the chairs in the country. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of support. I won that race. I don't have to go into detail, but I won that race. So I had an office in DC and an office in Boston as, my, as the state chair, an office of the state house, in an office in Somerset because I was a state rep. So I was a busy, busy lady. I think part of how we become so successful is we work three times as hard as everybody else. In addition to that, I mean, you know, who do the laundry? <laughs> <laughs> me, uh, you know who I didn't cook that I didn't do, but but w women just did all of the other things and kept tried to keep the house together and the family together, and um, anyway, I served for 20 years in the Senate in the House. I ran for the Senate and won. Um, I became the assistant majority whip in, this, in the Senate after two years, 
which was amazing. And I think part of it is everybody that appointed me knew I would work twice as hard as everyone else. And I would always be loyal. And I guess there's a couple of things I say. Always keep your word no matter what. No matter what. And I have been in a position where I gave my word. I was so sorry I gave my word, but I had to keep it. I kept my word. So every, anybody that ever asked me anything, you keep your word, people respect you, and they believe you. And, and the second part of that is, I guess women can do 20 jobs at the same time. They can run a family. They can, they can go shopping. They can study. They can work. They can do all that stuff. I, don't, I mean, I'm sure some men can do that, too. But I think because we try so much harder and we have all these jobs that... Um, some, it's, it's, we, we, can, we can do it all. We can do it all. And for people that tell women that they can't do it all, that's not true. You can do it all. You can have it all. So here I am at BCC. I'm actually a vice president, not a dean. Um, I decided not to run after 32 years. I just didn't want to campaign this time, and I just didn't feel like campaigning again and raising money and doing all that stuff. And I was lucky enough that um, there was a position open here, and I love every single minute of it. I do have to say that Jack Sprager has worked me harder than <laughs> almost any of the people I've mentioned. Um, I usually I start now about 8 o'clock in the morning, and I don't finish usually till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. There's always an evening event and always a morning meeting. So, And in between, there's stuff to do. So um, I guess... All I can say to you is that if I can do it, everybody here can do it. Every woman can do it. All they have to do is be willing to make the sacrifices it takes to work extra hard. And also, I, I, the other part of it is you have to work well with men because that's the reality. Half women, half men. So you have to learn how to work with men, and you can't... You can't in any way um, be uncomfortable with that. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, so we'll come back and uh, have an opportunity to ask each of these three women questions in a minute. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the big picture and go back to the 64% versus 77% and what's going on here. And I think you had a sense of this. I mean, once, on the one side, the progress, the persistence, the dedication, the willingness to fight through obstacles, the willingness to work hard, and so on. All those things are what made these women what they are, and it's all well, a lot of other women. And that's without that, there would have been no progress. Um, and it's also true that there have been changes in the law that have been helpful. In 1964, for example, for the first time, discrimination against women on the job was made illegal. Prior to that, you could say, I don't want to hire a person because they're a woman, and, then, and, and it was not a violation of federal law. You could do that based on race as well. That was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And there are programs that have been implemented since that time to try to enforce the, the spirit of that, um, including affirmative action where women where employers are expected to take a closer look at women in government jobs and jobs where uh, businesses are federal contractors. So all that has been helpful. Um, but there's still persistence uh, of discrimination that goes on, and I just want to talk briefly about that. I mean, part of it is just generally how much are women expected to be leaders and expected to be competent in these things that have traditionally been defined as male, and I think that's what each of you have been able to do is to demonstrate to people that that, but you had to demonstrate it. The, the initial assumption was that these are things that women, that men are good at, but that women tend not to be good at. Uh, in the level of management, for example, even though women have <coughs> made strides in the business world, only 4% of chief executive officers of large corporations are women. Right? That's, that's 20 out of 500, the, fi the Fortune 500. That's 480 men, right? Clearly, the 20 is a progress, <laughs> but it should be it should be closer to 250, right? Um, so that's a pretty big gap. 
you look at a field like engineering, it's high paid field, um, women are still highly underrepresented in that field, roughly 10% of engineers, uh, a little less than 20% now of women that are graduating as engineers. That is a big progress over the past, but it still means that 80, over 80% 80 of the graduates are male. Um, if you look at the highest paid jobs in any field, you see the same pattern. Um, for example, in the manual labor fields, right? Most, the 91% of people in the skilled construction trades and um, related fields are, are men, right? Those are the best paid of the blue collar jobs. And even among factory jobs that are semi-skilled, men have traditionally been the ones that mainly worked in the higher paid factory jobs. Women tended to work more in the minimum wage level factory jobs. Um, that's not to say that a lot of men are working in the lower paid areas as well, by the way. It's, it's just a question of distribution. So in any given field, what you get is that women tend to be compressed down toward the middle and the bottom, right, with a few exceptions, right, and then men tend to be better distributed throughout the field, and that's where you get the difference. So there are men that are working at levels that are below what many women are working, but the average favors men. Now, in that, in that area is a good example because when you talk about manual labor, immediately issues come up, for example, well, do women have the strength that you need to be able to do these kinds of jobs? So I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience. Um, we just had a speaker in New Bedford on this, first of all, a woman named Lynn Donahue, who's a bricklayer, right? And she's a skilled bricklayer who won a contest with the union on skills in bricklaying, right? Um, she, so she, and she's been very successful, and there's many women that have been successful in the construction fields. When I was teaching night school here years ago, I had two women that worked at Chamberlain Manufacturing, which at the time was a munitions factory in New Bedford making shells. And what you had to do if you worked a machine is take 50 pound to 70 pound shells off, on and off a machine and grind them and then, and so on. And the two women in my class were fairly slight of build, and I said to them, well, how do you handle the physical aspect of it? And they said, you just learn to bend your knees and get under it. You know, it was a skill question. Um, but what's interesting is I've never talked to a woman who said that they couldn't get a job or had a difficulty getting a job in a nursing home because of strength. And yet in a nursing home, you have to move dead weight in and out of a bed, right? Um, even a waitressing job. I mean, think about somebody having five or six plates on, on a tray moving around all day like that. Right, that's that takes physical strength, but no one raises that because it's it's those are stereotyped as women's work. It only gets raised in the context of of uh, what's seen as appropriate or not appropriate. Um, just a couple of other points. One is um, if you take a field like engineering, part of the issue is that it's defined as a male field, and so. Women, many women feel uncomfortable trying to achieve in a field where you're going to be judged and you have to work extra hard and have to prove yourself. The average person isn't going to do that, even though some people do, and that's why progress has been made. Um, part of it, though, is also that mathematics is involved with engineering. And there's a widespread belief in our society that, in that regard, that perhaps women don't have the same brains for math as men do. Maybe women are stronger in, in, in the verbal, you know, or, or Literary, literary fields, artistic, right? And you even have in psychology courses reading, you know, summaries of, you know, and then people are questioning whether maybe men are more developed on left brain, women are more developed on right brain. So the assumption is there's a biological difference there. And by the way, the research on that is very, very weak. There's no research that demonstrates that any real diff significant differences between men and women could be explained by biological differences, even if you accept and the fairly the non-conclusive research that tries to indicate that, that there are such differences, it's, it explains so little of the ultimate outcome as to be almost irrelevant. I know that because in my master's in psychology program, I studied that, and that you know. So, so you're talking about something that should be a, barely a footnote in a textbook, and yet it's put in oftentimes as something we should take seriously. Um, but the uh, the bottom line is that. You know, women, if you think about women's, women are doing just as well, if not better, in fact, in, in math courses as men, but still tend to view themselves as less capable in, uh, because of the messages they get, sometimes from teachers, but sometimes from the broader culture. And so based on that, many women who would otherwise be talented enough to be engineers 
end up shying away and going instead to fields that have been defined as more female, such as the human services, working with people, because that, that's consistent with the traditional role of women as, nur as the nurturers, right? And so many women, you know, I, it's striking how many women, like 76% of all psychology majors in college are women, right? Um, if you go to, so you take a look at social work programs and who's enrolled, it's primarily, it's, it's overwhelmingly women. Uh, you take a look in teaching below the level of administration, right? It, and in, in especially working with children, it's mostly women. Um, and so, you know, that ends up, so you have people gravitating toward professions that are very meaningful, but also lower paid relative to the professions that some men are able, talented men are able to achieve. Um, Going back to the, so, so basically there are, there, women and men are socialized in different ways and made more, and encouraged to go in certain directions, which then reflects inequalities. Um, one other piece, uh, Joan Menard was saying about doing the housework as well as, as well as her, her work outside the home. And that, you know, generally speaking, women still have the primary responsibility on home front. Uh, the statistics in recent surveys are that women do four times as much routine housework than men in married couples. Um, if you take all housework together, including repairs and you know, less routine things, women do twice as much. Women do three times as much childcare on average as men. By the way, that doesn't mean men aren't doing something. And the average man, for example, if, if in a family where the child is, is one to three years old, spends 60 hours a week between work and home. And it's not only work that he's doing, he's doing work in the home also. It's not that women are, men are doing nothing, but overall women are still in charge of the home front and yet are trying to achieve at the same time. And that, ha that makes a difference. Um, it makes a difference because, you know, yeah, you do try to work twice as hard so that you can do, play both roles, but you're up, you're up against ob objective obstacles. And sometimes people end up not taking some of those risks because of what it means for their family responsibilities. Sometimes women end up uh, not staying late at work, let's say, in professions because they want to spend some time with their kids, but maybe the man would, right? And so you get differences of those that come in around that. Um, and also it's been demonstrated that employers discriminate against women with children. Uh, the ad general attitude is if women have kids is that they're unreliable workers. Um, you know, men can take time off from work as well. It's not just, just, not just women. And, but the bottom line is that there have been studies that show that employers prefer people without children, both men and women. Uh, I should say without children. They prefer women without children versus women with children. They prefer men regardless of whether they have children because the assumption is they're not primarily responsible for the, for, for the, for the children. There's also been evidence that employers discriminate against women based on pregnancy even though that's not supposed to happen according to law. Um, and again, it's assumed that women can't perform adequately because of being pregnant rather than the fact that the truth of the matter is that women fight through the physical symptoms of, of pregnancy and pretty much do their job just as much as they did before until close to the time of birth. That's the typical pattern. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know that from your own lives. So anyway, that's a couple of, uh, so, so the point is there's a struggle that needs to be waged. The politics in this country relate to that. There are candidates that will push for legislation to increase enforcement of anti-discrimination laws or, or pieces of legislation that are needed, like Women's Pay Act, that address this issue continuing, and you have other politicians that are going to vote against it. That's what's at stake in the 2012 election in terms of national elections. Um, and it's often at stake every time we have state elections as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there and uh, ask you to ask whatever questions you might have of any of the folks that have spoken. Any questions at all? Um, I would think that women have to sacrifice more to get to the team. You know, um, like your profession, you held many offices, and uh, like not having children, putting your career first, I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, do you, do you feel that? Like I had two children. Right. <laughs> um, uh, my husband, um, really, when I was in Boston every day, um, I never got home before 7 or 8 o'clock at night. 
he took care of dinner, so that was just understood. At first he would wait for me, which was driving me crazy. He would call and say, okay, what time would you be home? And, uh, and I was like, I don't know, this place has no schedule. Uh, they just keep talking and doing, and so, um, and I remember, I remember when Ed Lambert went to the State House, the same thing happened uh, for men and women, but, but my husband took over dinner. That was it. Um, and, and by the time I got home, sometimes uh, my youngest daughter was in bed. My oldest daughter by that time was in college. So um, I didn't feel like I sacrificed anything. I felt like that was part of his responsibility. And, and uh, it, it's interesting, though, he's much he was much closer to the younger child because he spent so much time with her every day after school and, uh, and, and for dinner and stuff. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I did say to my youngest daughter, you know, I never made cookies. Uh, I never could do that kind of stuff. It was a bake sale at school or something. I'd buy cookies and bring them because I never had the time. I said, did you ever feel like, you know, I was, wasn't there when you needed me. She said, no. No, I didn't. I knew if, if I really needed to, you'd be there. And I was lucky I had a, a husband to, to help. Some people aren't in that position. They don't have the other person. But I think your comment is, is totally true, because my husband and I did not have any children for exactly that reason. Um, my husband was pursuing his career, and I was pursuing mine, and at that time, you know, as, as you just heard, it was frowned upon for a woman to be pregnant or to be, you know, in the workforce having small children because they were afraid that they'd have to go home <coughs> with the kids or do daycare or what have you. And so our election was to have no children. And I can say I have one son, and uh, I only had the one, and I can't imagine going home from some of my days in court and facing you know, three little children. I mean, it just would have been very difficult. And that was a choice because I, I really felt I couldn't, I couldn't do it. You know, that's, that's how I felt about it. Well, I think that you have, you know, you have, if, if you're lucky enough to have a partner, a husband or a wife, whomever is doing it, you have to share. And for my husband comes from a whole different background. His mother was home all day. She made like a big, lunch, it was like a, a dinner and uh, every day when he went home from, from school for lunch. And so it, it was just a different situation, but it was what it was. And uh, I guess that's what I said. It is what it is. <laughs> My wife, she works, uh, she's at work all the time. She feels like she's missing out, you know? She really gets to it. Yeah, see, I never felt that maybe. Um, and uh, as your children get older, if you have children, um, and you talk to them, I don't think they feel that. They like that balance, you know, because sometimes I think mothers feel like they have to be that person that takes care of the child, and they feel guilty that they're not. But fathers do a pretty good job. Yeah, they do. I mean, I think statistically, though, I mean, if you, what that's saying is that women that can succeed have to have some kind of family support. Oh, absolutely. Right? And that you may or may not have that. I mean, right. first of all, there's a lot of single mothers, right? That's a lot. I mean, eight out of t 10 single parents are single mothers. And so they may also have the family support, not because just because you're a single mother, you may have it from grandma, your sister, or even your ex, right, depending on the relationship, but it's still many don't have that. Yeah. And then some don't have it because of the nature of, of their relationship or because of the responsibility that the man have. Because if you're talking about professional families, oftentimes it's two professionals working together and the man has the same issues. And so who is going to come home and do the home front from five to seven or five to eight, right? So with that, and statistically what that produces is an inequality. If you've got some women that are able to do that, but some are being, some are not, and it takes something extra. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah, um, what field of work would you say has the biggest disparity of income between men and women? 
I'll just step in for a second, man. I think that there's, you know, people here can add to this, but I think a lot of it, it the, in there are different levels of underrepresentation that happen in different fields. The fields where there's the most powerful social uh, stigma toward women's participation are the fields where there's the greatest inequality, right? So these high-level professions typically, one by one, have had been fought through um, because they're seen more as male. There's other things that are not seen as much as male or where there's less resistance. So for example, the fields that I had cited, things like engineering, things like you know, there are other professions where there's less of a gap, right? But engineering, there's a lot more. In the case of blue collar work, uh, skilled blue collar work is definitely pretty extreme. In the case of higher level management, not so much middle level management, but higher level management positions, you see the same thing. If you guys want to add. Yeah, if you go into a meeting with all CEOs <coughs> in Boston, there might be one woman and 15 men. So if there is, you know, uh, there's a, is a disparity. I go to meetings here in Greater Fall River where there are CEOs. They're almost all men. They're almost all men. I sit on the Mass Society um, Committee for Governments and Audits, and I'm the only woman on the committee. Uh, would you say the blue collar work, like, it's, there's not many women because they don't really want to get their hands dirty, or because the men that dominate the fields really don't want to hire them? <laughs> the woman that uh, spoke the other day t experienced a lot in the New Bedford program, experienced a lot of resistance. She had a difficult time when she showed up at work sites, they had to partner up and she, they, they were guys that didn't want to, a lot of people didn't want to partner with her. <clears throat> Part of that I think was not really believing that a woman could do that kind of work well. And part of it sometimes can be the idea that this is seen as a way that men can get the income they need to be the providers that society has assigned to them, and all of a sudden, here are women coming in, taking a piece of that. Uh, if you saw, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie North Country, um, but it's, it's a, you could get it on Netflix or whatever. It's quite a, an amazing movie about the integration of the mines in uh, Minnesota. And that's, that was the, it was sort of like, why are you working here? You don't, you're not the, you're, you're not the provider. It's, we have that responsibility. If we don't, then we're failing in our role as men. Right. So seeing as cutting in on that, um, and therefore there's resistance. You know, but, I would say too, um, there's a lot of subtlety <coughs> in the resistance. When I went to the legislature years back, uh, and, and this is true today also, there's a lot of social activity after work. There's a lot of fundraisers at night. There's a lot of go out for a drink. There's a lot of stuff after work. And part of that is the bonding that you do with your friends. And um, I don't think they ever invited women to, do, to join them. Because I made them. I went anyway. <laughs> but, but now they do more. They do more. But when I first went there, it was the guys would go out after maybe a couple times a week after work and even have dinner or stuff like that. And um, they never invited anybody, any women. But why would you really want to go? Like, well, I'll, you know, like, I don't know. I kind of think, like, you don't belong there. Well, I'll tell you, you what. Know? I wanted to be a part of the, the culture. And so yeah, I became friendly with, you know, I worked with a couple of the guys. And so uh, I, once I just said, are you guys going out for a drink? And they said, yeah. And then he looked at me and went, do you want to come? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so you can't exclude yourself. I uh, felt like working with them should have been enough. Like, I work with you and I got here and look at me, but I don't need to go have beers with you. Well, you know, it's where it kind of comes to another yeah. aspect where, you know, this is, I don't know, I feel like people can get hurt this way. And, you know, if you push yourself too much in someone's face, you know, it's right. not good. Yeah. Right. If you push yourself yeah. too much, you're right. But I think mm. there's a little bit of, oh, it's almost like we didn't know you'd want to go kind of thing. And so, anyway. It worked. And well, like, you don't belong yeah. coming with us. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, if you work with men, work with them. But 
I don't know. I don't think it should be like women want to be, you know, we should be in everyone's business. I think maybe Herschel was along with saying, you know, I want to get to know you on a personal level and to kind of maybe say, you know, I'm paying with the best of them, you know, and kind of prove to them. I think what you're going to find, what, what I found, not what you're going to find, what I found, yeah, yeah. was a great deal of um, relationship building is social building, not just working. Mm -hmm. So I know her and her, so they, she calls me, would you like to be on this board? Would you like to do this? So it, it happens with the guys too. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a huge, um, I guess, it, it, for me it was the right thing to do. Yes. And I think it's more of an individual thing, absolutely. more or less than a man woman thing well I think the point is you that know. there's there's networking opportunities available there I mean you're talking okay. about you're talking about uh, decisions that are you know in communi you know work related communication that's going on in and amidst that it's sort of like so you go to one of those things and you say to yourself you know so and so is going to be there and at some point I'm going to ask them this question mm -hmm. right it's going to be the only thing I talk about about business but you've got your agenda and you go into those situations and it's a comfortable place to do it and you just and you have something in common and you ask them and it's easy to do it it's well, not impossible I, to do it on the job but it's and I think yeah. Dan and I have met each other socially and the reason he would feel comfortable calling me is because socially we have a relationship not yeah know. so I, I it does make a difference it does make a difference. I have to say the same thing I mean it, it definitely um, helps in terms of your business I mean if you're if you're in business um, to have social relationships and to be able to relate to people um, outside of, of the workplace I mean you do you build on that and and you can access that when you need it um, you know for work and it also it, it, it <coughs> It makes trust between people. I mean, if you're just seeing people in the workplace um, and, and you're doing your jobs and, and so forth, uh, you know, if you're outside of the workplace, it, it uh, you know, breaks down some of the, the particularly as a, as a female lawyer, you know, that, that I can't, you know, hang, um, you know, or that I'm very uptight or, you know, or, or very prissy or, or any of those things, you know, I certainly can and do, and, and it, it, it makes them more comfortable. Uh, with me, and it helps me um, get what I need to get done um, in a lot of situations. I'd like to add something to Lisa. I've been in the labor for since 1988, working construction my whole life, and I've never once worked with them. And now I'm not saying that they can't do it with the company that I've never had. Yeah. You know, like the company that I've seen, it seems like I've worked with. Well, there's a, there's a self-selection that can go on. It's not just, I mean, there may be some discrimination that goes on from employers or a reaction of guys when people try to break in, but there's a self-selection because in general, people are going to gravitate toward where you're encouraged to be and where you're not going to meet resistance, right? And these are not defined, you know, manual labor, particularly that type of manual labor, where it's mostly guys and where it's been defined, all the skills have been defined as male, it's like you've got to deal with that, and so you have to make a decision to do that. And there are other ways of making a living. They happen to be paid less. <laughs> That's the problem. But there are other ways of going. And so the path of least resistance is you shy away. And so you don't even get that many people thinking in those terms. And, it's, you know, I mean, I ask in my class every, every year when we talk about this topic, I'll say, okay, how many of you, asking both males and females, how many of you know cars? And I always get people raising their hands where they're both males and females. There's more higher percentage of men, but a significant percentage of women. And then, and then I, and there are guys that don't raise their hand, including me, by the way. And there's some women that, you know, don't as well. And when I ask the women, well, where did you learn it? It's almost always that somebody made a special effort, usually within the family, an older brother, or father, whatever, took them under their wing and showed them stuff, right? But so there are women have already proved themselves even at that level in terms of being mechanically minded and being able to do that kind of stuff. But the stereotype is it's males that know that stuff. And so men are supposed to be more inclined toward not just the physical labor of it and the strength and all that, but also mechanically minded, right? And so you end up gravitating toward the things that you feel the most comfortable with and that ends up becoming a, an inequality in the end. <coughs> I have a question. Oh, that's, as being an attorney in court work, um, do you still notice discrimination 
between the male and the female in today's society with uh, just about the way things are handled? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's true both of, of um, you know, the, the attorneys, uh, the court personnel, uh, as well as the litigants. Um, you know, uh, as I said, men are simply taken more seriously. And, and it's not so much, I mean, we're all older, okay? You get to a, <laughs> you get to a place where they don't need, you know, uh, you've been around long enough, they're used to you, um, you know, you know everybody, and, and you're okay. What I find, and I, I do mentor some younger women, is they are still experiencing the same things, okay, that I experienced of, you know, being treated um, sort of, you know, frivolously and, and um, uh, having male lawyers particularly talk very condescendingly and, and that sort of thing, which really, you know, impairs your credibility with the clients, with the judges, and, and with everybody else. I think what's different now is that, you know, uh, there is more of a consciousness about it, but boy, it still goes on. And in the court system itself, it's, um, the, all the clerical people are, the, uh, are primarily women, you know, 90%. And uh, you'll find that, you know, most of the clerks are, are going to be males. Um, they have more power. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still there. Uh, it's, it's still there uh, everywhere. It's being improved. It's, it's much improved, I mean, but... <laughs> You know, we got a long way to go. I, I think a lot too goes to the professionalism of, of a woman who is who is being in this particular situation. For an example, um, just your attire. So if you dress, I mean, I had to laugh because um, you wouldn't go to court dressed if you were a woman with a sweater and a pair of slacks on. Um, you wouldn't go to court dressed in a red suit but you would wear a dark colored suit because that's what you're expected to wear. So if you, you were, you're treated a lot more equal today than you were years ago, but some of it is just the way your attire is. Not mm -hmm. necessarily that you're equally as smart or um, that you're not, but I have found certainly, I mean, I have a situation right now where I'm sitting on a hiring committee and there's a woman who is very, very capable of the particular position that she is applying for. And they will not give her that position because in front of certain committees, she will not dress professionally, at least in their mind, based on the way she came to the interview, based on the way she dresses at work now, in their mind, she will not make the best um, presentation at a particular committee meeting. And so I know she's not going to have but yet she's probably the brightest of the applicants. So a lot of it goes just to your time. Yeah, I was going to kind of say that. I know, it, you know, like a lot of, I don't know, I'm probably not good for this conversation, but I think the problem with women are women and not men. I think a lot of women, I grew up as a woman, as a young girl. I had to watch TV. I had to see friends. It's just how we feel. I mean, it, you see every woman putting out a certain aura, a certain atmosphere, a certain look at me, a certain acceptance, and we can't help but fall into that because our mothers did it, our grandmothers did it, our sisters did it, you know, and now here you are going, well, do, do I fight the world or do I just, you know, live, like just be alive? And, you know, a lot of times I just feel like women are hurting themselves and putting themselves in situations either they shouldn't have treaded on or, you know, now they're dead because they wanted to push themselves somewhere where if we would have just been more quiet, you could have gotten there in a better way. But if it's you know? a career you want to pursue, it's a risk you want to take. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to pursue that career, take the risk because you'll get there. <coughs> but the bottom line is that we as men do not get judged on certain things the way women get judged on certain things. Whether it be whether it be dress or whether it be appearance, mm -hmm. right? Weight. I mean, all those kind of things. I mean, you look at restaurants, right? Who gets hired to be a barmaid? Who gets hired to be a waitress? Right? There, it's you know, there's standards that are based on it's not who can be the best waitress. Or it's only not part. Or not only that. It's also who's going to be be attractive, you know, by society standards. And so, 
And then women in general are, you know, in the social world are evaluated much more and based on appearance. It's not to say that there isn't some issue with guys too, you know, but it's guys prove themselves more traditionally in terms of their desirability by accomplishing things in the world. Women prove themselves desirability by being physically attractive, right? And now they're, now everyone's upset, like, I want to be taken serious, not because of my looks. Well, for the past 60 years, that's all you've been shoving in our faces. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Well, now we're all looking at you and going, well, I'm smart too. Right. Too late well, for I'm that. Not, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing with that at an individual level, but I'm saying that that's a reflection of society and how society shapes. Well, well, that's People. our generation. That's what my daughter's saying now, and she's six, and it's not about, you know, we're women and here are minds, and, you know, it, I don't know. It's like I, beating a dead horse. Kind of. I have to say that, uh, you know, I, I, and I say this all the time, <clears throat> I lived my mother's dreams. I've, I've lived them because my mother, um, because of her generation, um, was not allowed to go to college despite the fact that she had a full scholarship uh, to go to college and instead married and had children. But she was very um, forceful in inspiring us um, to get an education. And, you know, I was the oldest. And uh, particularly, you know, that was going to be, you know, because she, you know, she was frustrated as, as a housewife. Um, she had so much more to offer and um, didn't have the opportunity to do that because she never could get back to college because she kept having kids. Um, so, I mean, I, and I think that, um, you know, that's, that's been an important part of what's pushed me forward um, to do this. And I all, also try to inspire, uh, you know, young women to, to, to push the limits. And, uh, it's, it, you know, it may not be easy, but it's certainly satisfying once you get over the hurdle. I have two daughters, and um, both of them are work and are very successful in what they do. Um, one of them at 5 o'clock wants to go home and cook like she likes that, she wants to do that. It definitely came from her father. <laughs> uh, and the other one is much more ambitious and, and in a different way and travels and does stuff and, and uh, so, but I think they've, they've sort of moderated both of those things. They know that in order to do what they do, especially the youngest one, um, she has to look a certain way, mm -hmm. and not that she has to look beautiful, but she has to look professional, she has to dress professionally, um, and she has to um, uh, work with a lot of men. I watched her run a meeting the other day, and I think there were two women in the room and 15 men. So, so, so but she's established relationships with those men that are not just like I work here and everything, but like I can call, she can call them and say, uh, could you help with this? Could you do? I mean, it's a different. So they do. They they get it. They get it. Uh, they didn't have to work quite as hard as our generation did with it because because it's hopefully we did clear a path a little bit. Are there other questions? Oh, yes. Um, now that there are more women in uh, professional fields, do you feel that uh, there's more competition, uh, higher professional positions? I don't think there's more competition between women. Um, at least in, in my observation, uh, no, I, I don't see women competing again. In fact, I think women really try to help other women a lot. Um, I was on a, recently on a search committee, and it was a very, very, very prestigious position. It hasn't been filled yet. And they've narrowed it down. And um, all the women I know are pushing for the woman. And she's ta talented, qualified, whatever. And we, we're getting the men sort of, because it's a real high position, we're getting the men sort of ready to say, you should have a woman in that position. There's never been a woman in that position, and she's most qualified. So I found women helping other women. Yeah, I, ha I have to agree. But on a staff level, when they're, you know, you're graduating from college and you're going to look for a job on a staff level, in my office for an example, um, the women and the men are both treated equally when they come in for a staff position. 
because I know um, television particularly portrays that there's sort of a between women. They can be. Like the same <laughs> they like can that. be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of um, street food right now. You have to have a lady on your throat. Um, yeah. That's the way it is. You have to have one female in the direction of traffic or directly trained. They do know a few women that do wear trains in Boston. So, and they get paid just like the men, five bucks an hour. What that, what that reflects is, as mentioned before, affirmative action. A lot of the organizations we're talking about here, like a law firm, for example, are not, are not subject to affirmative action, right? Or, uh, or an accounting firm. And you're, you're talking about private companies. As soon as a private company becomes a government contractor, which is often kind of like a defense contractor, whatever they are, but government is. And so affirmative action has tended to take hold more in government than it has anywhere else. And so that's been implemented in different ways, but one way would be to say a woman has to be on every street crew. Yeah. Do all companies have to be you know, uh, interests or well, if, if you're subject to affirmative action, you have to have a plan, yeah. and your plan is the plan is how over time you're expecting to to move toward a goal of equal representation based on the qualifications that exist in the area, um, and so you have to do report what kind of progress you're being made. How much that plan is enforced really depends a lot on different factors. Some areas there's been a lot of push, in other areas it really hasn't met that much. Um, so if you add it up, it's been a factor in some professions and not so much in others. I think One that, more. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of those uh, regulations really only apply to larger companies or companies that are doing business with the government. Yeah. So for the most part, small businesses aren't required in any way uh, to do any kind of affirmative action. And, and in government, in all the positions I've ever held, in the state house, or there's been no requirements. In other words, I could hire for my staff five men or five and no, and no women or five women and no men. I mean, there were no constraints on who we hired or... Now, you try to balance it off, you know, here, but... But at BCC, for example, we have an affirmative action plan that includes gender as well as race. It only becomes a real issue if you've got an under significant underrepresentation. So you have to look area by area to see where where are women seriously underrepresented? Where aren't they? Because obviously you don't have to work hard to achieve equality if you already have equality. But I um, would say, even at BCC, <coughs> I don't mean to speak. No, you, uh, it's not that much. Yeah. Find fault, but if you look at all the secretaries, they're all women. Yeah. And yeah, there's some administrators that are women too, but the majority of men. Yeah. yeah. That could be. But I think in terms of the clerical, I mean, generally speaking, what happens is women gravitate to the areas that they're most able to go into. Men of the same, men are going to tend to gravitate toward better paying jobs. Right. So you have the man who otherwise would have done that if it was defined as a male job, who was doing something else that's defined as a male job that's better paid. So you end up having, to some extent, women are getting the leftovers, to, to a degree. Anyway, I think the time is up. Uh, I want to thank every, our panelists who did a great job. Yeah. Please fill out your evaluation forms before you leave, and thank you very much for coming.